Well, first of all, um, thank you all for attending. Uh, you know, it's it's the first one of our, our relaunch of our um, Gigabot X, now uh, Fused Granular um, Fabrication User Group. And we're so honored to have participation from around the world. Um, we're hoping to, the intention is to make this um, a regular opportunity. So once a month on the second Tuesday um, at two central, we can, um, we will be hosting another one of these. Um, the hope is we'll experiment with the format today and, and evolve it based on your feedback. Um, but our, our thought based on what we heard from some of you guys individually and lessons learned from when we've had meetups before is that um, it'd be really helpful if we held it on a consistent day and time once a month. Um, once we, um, Re3D kind of finishes an update of where we are in terms of our experiences with pellet printing, um, we'd love to hear from you if this day and time works well, if there's a lot of consensus that it's not working well for our, our friends internationally, um, we can we can try and um, experiment with it a different time and, and also maybe follow up with a survey too. Um, but again, we are um, so humbled to have everyone on. We're honored to have um, some of you all as, as community members and Gigabot users. Um, please know your friends and pellet printing or um, granular fabrication are welcome to join whether or not they have a Gigabot X platform. We're hoping this can be a resource for you all to, to share. Um, I would say what Re3D has learned over the last um, six plus years and our experience printing with pellet is a lot of us, especially those printing from plastic waste and reclaimed waste, are encountering the same challenges. So we want to provide a, a resource for you to, to learn from people that have um, uh, found success and, and failure. So hopefully uh, we can all be more efficient with our time. Um, so with that being said, seeing this was the first one and we, we weren't sure uh, how the participation was going to be, Re3D offered to kick this off with just a summary of where we are in terms of Gigabot X. Um, the hope is that going forward, a presenter would um, present content for 20 to 30 minutes and then have opportunity for Q&A and networking. Again, we can change that format um, if you think there's another structure um, that would be helpful. And then also, I want to apologize for the late start. And if the video was a little bit wacky, um, as some of you may have heard, um, Re3D is growing. And we're in the process right now of getting a new facility in Austin and um, relocating some of our Houston team. So in that segue, a couple of us are based out of my garage and house because um, we're too big for our Austin office uh, <laughs> and our new facility isn't ready yet. So hopefully um, in the upcoming months too, you'll get a, a glimpse of kind of where we are in, in our new facilities. Uh, we do have our, our teammate, um, Sammy is plugged into our Houston office. Charlotte is out today um, with a, a gigabyte X uh, that we're preparing for an Air Force customer. Um, and then behind us here in the garage, we have a research platform that Doug will be sharing more about as we look at share some of the research that we're doing with Gigabot. So um, thank you for the flexibility and um, in the awkward start and, and sprawling locations. Again, we're looking forward to, to sharing uh, where we're going in 2024 with you as, as we navigate this all together. Um, so with that being said, um, we'll kick things off with the with the re 3D presentation, unless anyone has any questions about about the format um, for this meetup. Awesome. We'll get we'll get started. And Doug's driving because um, I had a computer teed up and then the sound went out right before this. He's started. And on our end, while we're getting started today, obviously there's Doug and myself from my garage, Jen from the office in my house. We've got Will tied in from our Houston factory, Patrick, who's on the road um, remotely, and Sammy, who's um, showing you the Gigabot X in the Houston factory. So we hope this is the first of several monthly um, meetups uh, with the community. Uh, rather than calling it a Gigabot X user meetup, uh, the marketing and sales team at Re3D had a good point that with the engineering team that maybe we should rebrand it, the FGF user group. Again, knowing that this is your user group, this is not just intended for Gigabot X users. Um, we know some people say granular, some people say granulate, some people just say pellet printing. So if you have strong thoughts about what we call this going forward, um, we're happy to um, adjust it as, as it's most appropriate and inclusive. Oh, I don't know how to flip slides. Doug's teaching me a lot today. 
Um, so for context, uh, just to, to bring things uh, full circle for a couple of y'all and to bring people up to speed, I see um, uh, some early Kickstarter backers for Gigabot X on the call. Um, you know, from Marie 3D's perspective, we had a vision to print from um, plastic waste, which involved over time into a, a vision to print from pellet or flake. Um, and in order to accomplish that, um, how we decided to go about it was to modify our filament printer uh, with the ability um, to, um, you know, have have the ability to um, extrude pellets or flakes. So basically we just modified the business head, the top part of the machine. That's why it looks very um, familiar for those of you that have used um, our filament-based printer printers. Um, because our filament-based printers were called Gigabot, for the pellet version, we called it X, um, kind of stepping into the next frontier. That's what was really cool at the time. And so what you see here is kind of a version of the initial prototype that was developed um, thanks to funds to the National Science Foundation, as well as winning some pitch competitions that we may have um, shamelessly solicited uh, votes from you all um, to, to win, um, to get to that um, prototype that was then launched on Kickstarter. Um, it was one of um, three campaigns we've had to help um, further our research. And for those of you that contributed to that, you know, we consider you our micro investors and are just so honored to have your support. Um, those early versions were then shipped around the world um, as a small campaign. And then using that feedback, um, that then inspired several other um, changes as we believe, you know, the, the platform should always have a path to upgrade. And we knew early on that um, there was going to be a lot of evolution in this platform because this is kind of a newer segment of 3D printing, especially at scale. So from our bias and our motivation, you know, we really got into this with a heart for economic empowerment. Um, in addressing gaps in the in the market to make 3D printing more accessible um, and really with a lean towards recycling. So you'll see a lot of our research efforts internally focus on flake or diff different forms of reclamation. Um, again, that's just our bias, but we're looking forward to sharing um, research that y'all have been doing in progress with virgin materials as well and um, with pellets. So um, if you can see from this picture, which is actually several iterations into Kickstarter, we've, we've come quite quite a ways. Um, that early version had to be manually fed. Um, <laughs> it didn't have the hopper that you see now or that uh, Bellows gantry system. And, um, you know, we we designed it basically more as, as a prototype without really thinking through, um, you know, what it would look like to serve us up to 60 countries like we do now and, and over time. So. As the hardware has evolved, we had to really have an eye towards manufacturability as well as a robust supply chain. Okay, so I go next. Mm -hmm. So um, over, over the pandemic, we did run into um, supply chain issues with some of our vendors um, and um, had to do some substitutions. Around that time, the hardware, both on the filament and the pellet side was evolving. So that led to what we call the Gigabot X2. It is our official second generation of Gigabot X. Um, if you haven't seen it yet online, this is what it looks like. Um, you know, hopefully it's still tracking towards like more of an industrial um, platform that enables the ability to start to explore both pellets and flakes. Admittedly, we're starting, still learning a ton about the materials um, science. We are not material scientists. We are hiring for one, so tell your friends. Um, and then really starting to also look at how we make the machine, you know, more user friendly as well. On our, um, our filament-based platform, around the time of the Gigabot X2 development, we realized we were overdue to really Im improve and recognize our electronics. Um, so you'll see some changes in the next slides. And then we also really started to dial in on like how we control the screw and, and the heating elements. And again, thinking about repeatability with, menu with manufacturing, we've now um, delivered uh, well over a hundred of these pellet printers. Um, so we really need to be thinking long-term about how we how we support you in that and enhance your experience. Um, so this is just an example. We have a 32-bit PCB now. Um, we co-developed that with a company called Ulta Machine. Some of you may know in the open source community that is paired with a Raspberry Pi. And with that now we've migrated from Marlin firmware to Clipper. Um, as well as with the front mounted touchscreen, a number of our users said, you know, they really didn't like walking around to the back of the machine to use the Vicky ASTI. Um, so we wanted to provide um, more of a, uh, a user-friendly experience. 
It also opens up the possibility for some other really cool things we can share in other webinars if you like in terms of managing a fleet, connecting to Wi-Fi, potentially installing a webcam. And currently we are working on a mesh compensation um, uh, system as well to help with you know, more of that, that um, automatic leveling experience um, with your bed. We do have a blog that highlights some of these um, changes as well. We can uh, put in chat and send as a follow-up if you wanna see some of the decisions that had to go into getting us to the X2 platform. Um, so that's just a brief background on, on who we are. Our, again, our bias, I think all of us on this call have a different motivation and passion for how they came into this conversation. And I'll turn it over to Doug to dive into some of the um, changes that we've been making since that release um, since April. Um, there will be an upcoming engineering update, as well as some research that's going on that may allow for some um, upgrades later this year. Cool. So as Samantha mentioned, we want this to be uh, kind of an adjustable format, the, the presentation that is. So if you guys want me to stop or you have thoughts or we should open up another discussion, just let us know. Um, if Samantha and I don't see it on here, Jen can catch any, any if you raise your hand in Zoom or just say out loud, we'll, we'll stop and go into another discussion. I think we have, uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, just to be very explicit, Samantha brought this one up, but we do have a new um, touchscreen. So since the release, we uh, developed a new touchscreen that has a better fit and finish, a little more uh, robust as well. So one of the things we've been working on on the R&D world is a device, um, we call it the crammer. In other realms, it's called an assistive feed device. Basically, it's a method for pushing um, low bulk density material into our extrusion system. So I'll play this collapse really quickly. Basically this uh, device, which we call the crammer, just bolts right onto the extruder and still uses the hopper and feed tube that we have on our current design. But what this does is basically forces material, causes it to flow and forces it into the extruder so we can print from things like very low bulk density water bottle flake, for example, which has a uh, kind of a, a parent or bulk density of about a third of pellets or less. We've even, we've even been printing from foam. Um, we have, I think we have a forum post coming up on that soon. Yeah. Um, that's some work with the Army and with NASA. So we'll be bringing that up maybe in some future sessions. Oh, and do you want to highlight the QR codes? Oh, yeah. Thank you. This QR code at the bottom left, if you want to scan it, or I can send the link after is a form to fill out if you would like to be a beta tester of this crammer. So if you have any interest in printing from Flake and you have a Re3D pellet printer, preferably one of the new ones, newer ones, um, then go ahead and fill out that form and we will um, put together a list of potential beta testers. Okay. So another one of the R&D things we've been working on, sorry for the weird aspect ratio, I just noticed that. Um, one of the weird, <laughs> one of the new R&D things we've been working on is a fourth heating element. So over on the left, you see our, our current extruder design that has three heater bands. This is just like a, an extruder in you know the, the plastic injection molding industry. There's three different sections of the screw. So we have three different sections of heating. Um, one of the things that we don't have on the current design is a way to heat the nozzle. So this is a nozzle heater. Um, we've just basically threaded it into the bottom of the extruder and we put one of our standard nozzles right in there. This works particularly well for materials that have a tendency to crystallize uh, when they're cooled just a little bit below melt temperature. Examples of that would be like um, PET from water bottles. So we found that if we're printing from water bottles, water bottle flake that is, it prints very well until you stop for a second. And then as soon as you stop and the material has a chance to cool in our standard nozzle, it will harden and it's very difficult to get it out of there. And so this nozzle heater has helped us and we've been able to print for, for long periods of time with starts and stops with this nozzle heater. And this is just an off the shelf version, very much a crude R&D project, um, but we will hopefully have a, a more refined version coming out soon. If anybody wants to test this on their own and they have a GBX, that QR code in the bottom has instructions for implementing this on your own machine. Again, it's just all off the shelf components. So you could literally buy this stuff throw it on your machine. Um, I have the code in that link that you would need to implement on your machine, as well as uh, the wiring diagram. So there are some wiring changes that you would need to make. But anyway, if anybody has questions about that, they can reach out to us and we'd be happy to facilitate their testing. I guess it's worth to mention for those of the people that are less familiar with 3D or um, how we came into this 
Um, we do consider ourselves an open source company. I know that means a lot of things to different people. Um, so if, you know, at any point um, you want to see what we're working on or see the drawings, if we have them made, we're happy to provide them um, in those builds and materials. And then in terms of the current Gigabot X users that might be on this call or future calls, um, the hope is for anything that might cross over as an upgrade, a path to upgrade um, or an accessory. Um, typically, the what we've been experimenting with in these different releases is identifying five customers that are really good from different backgrounds of giving um, shameless feedback. Um, and we can provide that to you in a form factor um, for free with the expectation within a certain period of time, you'd be able to offer those insights. So if you want to be flagged as a beta user for anything you see in this webinar, or other ones that we're working on or in our blogs, please let us know. And I forgot to add a QR code to be a beta tester for this product. So if you would like that, you could just send one of us an email. Um, our emails, if you don't know, are typically just our first name at re3d.org. So here's a Samantha, mine is Doug. Jens is Jennifer. Um, yeah, reach out to any of us and I'd be happy to set up a beta test of this product as well. Uh, cool. I see some of you taking pictures of the QR code. If it's a, a problem, just send a message in the chat and we'll just send you the link directly as soon as we're done. Uh, and by the way, we're happy to stop and go into details if you'd like at any point. Um, so this goes into a little more on the research side and a little less on the R&D side. Um, some of our work, uh, grant work specifically, is revolving around water bottle processing right now. Uh, and Patrick, who's on the call, I believe, is uh, kind of driving this effort. He's studying a whole bunch of different water bottles and how much um, uh, yield they have. So if we take a water bottle, remove the label, the cap, et cetera, and just focus on the PET bottle itself and granulate that, um, Patrick was able to get, he did, <laughs> hundreds if not thousands of trials here and was able to come up with that the separation manual separations um, phase of this takes about 18 seconds per bottle the granulation time so once you throw the bottle in the granulator which is basically just an industrial wood chipper uh, takes about eight seconds and from the whole bottle label cap etc you get about 77 well including the granulation step with you know what's lost to the granulator um, you get about 77 percent yield and because of that if you wanted to uh, granulate enough water bottles to print for 24 hours, it's almost six hours of manual processing time. So we noticed that this is a uh, limitation. We're working on other projects, which we'll bring up hopefully in later webinars. Uh, for example, a granulator that has a, a project we're working on with Oak Ridge National Lab, and they're developing a granulator that has a separation stage to it, basically, so we could get clean sorted flake out without the manual processing stuff. We're also aware we have some customers in the audience um, or users who who may have um, had thoughts about this too. So um, you may or may not see presentations from them in the upcoming months. And if, if you have um, research you'd like to share, we can um, pair that together as well in upcoming webinars. Yeah, so just very explicitly, I know some people on the call have been processing full water bottles, which um, meaning the label, the cap, et cetera, or, or just the cap in the bottle. Um, so that's really interesting and we'd love to have webinars on that later. Uh, also on the uh, PET water bottle end of things, um, again, this work is being driven by Patrick for the most part um, down in Houston. He studied the drying conditions for PET and found that um, basically the summary is that it's very difficult to dry water bottles uh, to the recommended levels, the recommended levels coming from mostly from the extrusion industry. Um, but the plot on the left is the moisture content with uh, over the course of drying for about 22 hours. Uh, this is in a desiccant dryer, but actually, uh, yeah, this is in a desiccant dryer, but we also have a, a similar plot for a um, for a food dehydrator, which is what we typically recommend our customers use just because they're lower cost and more accessible. Um, the QR code in this slide will take you to Patrick's forum post that has much more information on this. It's really well done. Um, yeah. And then the study on, or excuse me, the plot on the right is showing once you've dried that flake and you let it sit for a little bit, how much moisture does it reabsorb? And what Patrick is really getting at with this is, you know, if you're trying to print a long print and you have material in the hopper, it's impossible right now with our current design to keep that entirely dry. So it's going to gain moisture and we wanted to characterize that and figure out, you know, either if we need to make a remedy or what that remedy might look like. So you can see in just a very short period of time, it, it regains a lot of its moisture content. 
And again, this is PET specifically from water bottles. Um, and I think, let me just check something quickly. Is Mike P on the call? Oh, great. Yes, yeah. Yep. Cool. So Mike, do you want to take this slide? Do you feel up for it? Sure. Um, yeah, do you want to introduce yourself, Mike? Hey, um, my name is Michael Pujols. I am from Puerto Rico and I am Richie's uh, 3D designer. And here I am working on some um, some experiments, which is like um, with the challenges of uh, 3D printing with pellets. Um, right now we don't currently have a cooling system for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these the complex prints that you see on the screen. Um, and so it was really interesting to be able to like um, work around slicer profiles and uh, material um, properties to get these right. A lot of these, uh, most of these are printed with uh, um, recycled um, PETG pellets. And um, the first, uh, the first row is a uh, um, prosthetic uh, rotation plastic um, prosthetic cover. The other one is a uh, a uh, dodecahedron lamp that I made with a very, very thin walls, about 1.5 millimeter um, thin walls. Um, the other one is a kite frame that's directly printed on a um, polyester um, fabric. Um, all these were very surprising um, accomplishments that worked. Um, a lot of these are mainly just experiments on like uh, the, the thinness of the material, how how much time could it take to to treat print, um, and then compensating for like uh, the idea of no cooling fan and um, and maybe just uh, seeing just how good uh, recycled plastic um, can be after you know after processing. Um, I did do a non planar two D printing test um, using a grasshopper, um, a plugin for Rhinoceros three D, um, which is a completely custom decode. Um, and we have some progress with that. Um, I'm looking forward to um, uh, sharing uh, an in-depth uh, process, um, maybe a tutorial on, on the blog post soon. Thanks, Mike. Um, a few other things on, on Mike's work. He's releasing um, the G-code for these files every Friday, uh, not all of the ones that you're seeing here specifically, but he's releasing some really cool prints every Friday. All the Friday. ones that work. All the, all the ones that were. Um, and uh, ultimately, I think we hope to release uh, some of Mike's factory files as well mm -hmm. so that you guys can play around with them. One of the things that, that might be surprising to a lot of you is how small uh, layers Mike is using given the nozzle size. So Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for a 175 nozzle, 1.75 millimeters, you're using a, a layer height of around 0.6 something millimeters. Yeah, um, a lot of these are 0.8 millimeter nozzles. Um, the the prosthetic leg one and the and the lamp is one point um five, I'm sorry, uh, one point point eight millimeter, and then the kite is one point seven five millimeter nozzle, which is uh, about, and the kite like width is about like three layers, um, one point seven five millimeter nozzle. Um, I did do a couple of tests on those layers of one point seven five millimeter nozzle to get like right because the kite has to have some flexibility it can't be like super mm -hmm. um so yeah a lot of these uh took a lot of research and development designs well yeah thank you mike um see so yeah, our, our typical layer height for a 175 nozzle is usually around one millimeter so mike's using you know yeah 60 percent of that basically okay so as we're um, trans transitioning, um, obviously material science is a big part of us understanding uh, <laughs> virgin and, and non-virgin um, pallet and flake printing and Gigabyte X, as well as the materials prep when we get into those waste streams as Doug has um, highlighted. Um, and then finally thinking about the slicing parameters. A lot of what we have printed with today is you know, using Simplify 3D, um, which is you know, really intended for filament-based printing. Um, but we have been participating in some of the um, conversations with the pellet printing community. I don't know if you want to highlight that, Doug, in an upcoming event with Oak Ridge. 
do you know when that, remember when that is slug yeah um, or do you, what that group is yeah so um oak ridge national lab has their own slicing software that they've developed and it's mostly specific to um to pellet printing or to granulate printing it does work with filament printers of course but it you know it was developed around um printing with flayed pellet etc and on very large systems and they have a user group coming up in may i believe it's may 6th i'll double check on that date um but you can sign up online for that uh, i think it's going to be virtual as well so you can you can watch i think some of the re 3d folk are hoping to go as well um so we can learn from them and contribute um, we're, we're working with some of the folks there to develop a profile in that slicer that would be specific to our pellet printers as well. So more to come on that. Yeah. And then just to make this interactive, if you're comfortable sharing for those of you on that are printing with pellets, whether or flake, whether it's our machine or another platform, we'd love to see, um, just as a quick survey, while we wrap up our presentation, we'd love to hear what slicer, um, or slicers you are using. Um, just so we're mindful of that as we think about our priorities and profile development on over this year. And we can be sure again in the follow-up email after this webinar to send a link um, to the, the Oak Ridge event. Um, so then just to kind of wrap things up on our end, um, because you may be seeing some of the news, in addition to all of the awesomeness, uh, potentially Patrick will share in a future webinar on our work with um, NASA and modifying this platform. We do have several um, federal and non-federal awards right now around um, printing out of shipping containers. And that's because it takes a lot of hardware. Some of you all have observed um, that are trying to print with waste in order to print what we call point of need. Some people call it or on demand. Um, so we have a few different opportunities where we're looking at using one to two shipping containers wired into shore power, being powered by a generator, looking at other um, off-grid forms of um, power supply that allow you to have a more mobile means um, of, of producing goods from waste on site. And a lot of it drew inspiration admittedly from, from COVID when so many of us were making PPE with filament printers. Um, it started off initially with some investigations you see to the, the left um, end of this of your of the chart from your view where you see the, the lettering um, A through D where we were just looking at pellets and trying to understand you know what you could do um, with you know uh, limitations around um, part pulling and some of the complexities that we've highlighted um, and really admittedly with an eye towards water bubbles. That's why a lot of our early work focused on that. However, since then, we've started to look at taking failed prints. Uh, we print big, so we have big prints that maybe um, our fails are no longer used or our customers do and turning those into things, whether it's small objects to stabilize soil to larger designs or, or reprints. We've also started looking at, you know, how many times, how many thermal cycles, say like PLA, like you've seen here in the middle, um, can be reclaimed. We've also started to look, we have a couple of um, awards at the Department of Defense, um, looking at objects that might be um, not just specific to DOD, but other users that allow us to take large forms of plastic and to grind it up to make objects that could be functional. Um, again, we still have a long way to go in the understanding, you know, what's feasible with the current um, configuration of Gigabot X2 and potential other accessories that are needed, such as that Ford heater band, or part pooling, um, but there are a number, and there's examples here of efforts that have been underway that have included, you know, at limited scale, working with um, films or even um, foams, as Doug highlighted um, previously. So we call that form factor the GigaLab, if that's something you're interested in learning more about, we can let you know. And we're really honored that um, Mike, as part of his role as our 3D designer, is actually based out of one of the GigaLabs in um, San Juan, Puerto Rico. It's funded by, um, a match with our NSF award with the um, Puerto Rican Science and Research Trust. So um, if you find yourselves in Puerto Rico or if you're on the island or you live in an island um, community as some of you do, um, Mike's looking you know, over the course of this year to identify ways specific to that type of environment and potential objects that could be made. So we'd love to hear um, your nominations and to connect with any peers um, that you have, know of that could be um, helpful in addition to our um, defense sponsored research. Um, so with that in mind, that, that wraps up, I think, right, our, our portion of the quick update on what we've been doing from COVID and beyond and, and evolving the pellet printer that we know the best, which is, is the one that we're working on. Um, but we would love to turn things over to you all for Q&A. We can stop the recording um, as, as well at this point, so feel free to, um, to share freely and um, also...